Birmingham to London in 49 minutes, but at a cost of £32.7 billion. Is it worth it? The high-speed rail link will cut a dash through the Chilterns, churning up miles of pristine countryside, destroying hundreds of homes and blighting thousands more. Good evening from the Buckinghamshire town of Wendover. Apart from the odd passing car, it's peaceful and chocolate box pretty here. But just yards down the road, the new high-speed trains will hurtle through at 250 miles an hour. The government says that will bring jobs and prosperity to the whole country, the dawning of a new age of the railway and the biggest investment in a generation. That's small comfort in towns like this, though. The trains won't even stop here, and residents say the noise will make their lives a misery and their homes unsellable. No wonder there's talk of legal action and ministerial resignations tonight. It shouldn't have happened in the first place. There are three alternative routes, so they say. One of them's up the M1 corridor. Why didn't they put it up there? So the high-speed rail route linking London to the northwest will go ahead. The Transport Secretary, Justine Greening, described it as the most significant transport infrastructure project since the building of the motorways. The first stage will see trains run between London and Birmingham in 49 minutes. It will eventually run on to Manchester and Leeds, though that route has yet to be finalised. High-speed trains would then be able to link up with existing services to Scotland. Extra lines will connect to Heathrow and the continent. Today, the government announced that more of the line will run through tunnels under North West London, Great Missenden and Wendover, lessening the impact on the countryside and perhaps on Conservative support in those areas. Trains won't actually run along the line until 2026, but the arguments have already built up a fair head of steam. In a moment, I'll be going inside the pub here to talk to some of the people who will be affected. First, our political correspondent, Michael Crick, reports. At Westminster, a cross-party group of MPs and the music producer Pete Waterman marked the day when, after two years of protest, High Speed 2 got the green light. It'll mean growth and jobs, they say. More trains and more seats. So when it says more seats, does that more mean parliamentary seats? Absolutely. <laughs> and critics say much of any growth will be diverted from places like Wales and Cornwall. But isn't this just going to divert, divert jobs and growth? Yeah, we like, we like diverting them. So it's to the north where we need them. So, so there isn't an economic benefit then? Of course there is. Because of the clogs. We can get rid of our whippets. After almost 55,000 public submissions, ministers have changed the route of HS2 slightly and the nature of that route. Through Rislip, where protesters gathered this morning, the line will be hidden now by almost three miles of tunnel. That seems to have won round the London Mayor Boris Johnson just before he faces the voters in May. And most of the route through the Chilterns area of outstanding natural beauty will now be tunnel or deep cutting. But that still doesn't satisfy this couple who live right next to the plan line. They've put a derogatory term NIMBY against us so that anything we say from now on they're going to say, oh, well, he would say that, wouldn't he? Well, I'm afraid, no, I call them nilties. N-double-I-L-T-Y, not interested in listening to you. Economically, they've already had consultation on this, which says their own people who have said there is no backing for any economic sense in this at all. Ministers say the full HS2 Y-shaped scheme going on to Manchester and Leeds will cost £32.7 billion at current prices. But they claim that will be offset by up to £47 billion of benefits to the rest of the economy, plus up to £34 billion in fair revenue over 60 years. Those gains should be greatest, it's claimed, in Birmingham and northwards. It's worth every penny because you're talking about long-term investment in infrastructure. This country for too long has lived off scraps, particularly in the Midlands. We haven't invested enough. France spending twice as much. Jap Japan spending six times as much. Our infrastructure is creaking. The bills are now coming home to roost and we have to face up to them. But there is a business case. Every pound spent will bring another two in. Justine Greening compares HS2 to Britain's last great railway project, the Great Central, which opened in 1899. But some Tory MPs, especially those along this new route, 
are sceptical. How sure is she that the actual costs in their entirety of this project will be kept to the amount that we've been talking about? And how realistic is it for Britain at this very difficult economic time to be able to afford the cost of this project? Well, we, I would argue that we can't afford not to do this. HS2 involves economic arguments, environmental arguments and, of course, no end of politics at all levels. And today's announcement is by no means the end of the debate. This new railway will require legislation to go through Parliament. And there's also the strong possibility that objectors will try and challenge the railway in the courts. But with Labour on board, HS2 may now be hard to stop. The best chance, through pressure on local Tory MPs and ministers, could well have passed. Well, here with me now on the proposed route of the high-speed rail line are Martin Tett, the Conservative leader of Buckinghamshire County Council, and Steve Roderick, Chief Officer of the Chilterns Conservation Board. Martin Tett, the fact is the main artery, the country's main rail artery, the West Coast Main Line, will be full within a decade. So, sadly, you're paying the price locally, but it's in the national interest, isn't it? Well, of course, that's what the advocates argue. But, I mean, as local true, authorities... It? No, it's not. If you actually look at this, as local authorities, we're used to taking tough decisions, sometimes unpopular ones. But we've had independent experts look at this. Virtually every independent analyst has actually said the forecasts are exaggerated. They've got forecasts going forward to 2043, and everybody agrees you can't really forecast demand more than about 10 years. When you look at the business case, and you're talking about £32 billion worth of your money, my money, and everybody watching this programme's money, you have to make sure it's a good investment. But and it's a very, very poor business case. But business leaders, economists, union leaders, MPs, not all the MPs, obviously, but a lot of MPs support this. Are they all wrong? Well, I think what you've seen here is a classic Labour scheme from the old Labour regime. I saw Maria Eagle this afternoon stand up and say, remember, this was Gordon Brown's scheme. This is a classic tax and spend, massively expensive project, silver bullet to solve everything's problems. It isn't. The reality is there are better alternatives, far cheaper. And what we should be doing is investing in our infrastructure, but right across the country, rather than just on a single route to Birmingham. Steve Roderick, the government's done a lot, hasn't it, to lessen the impact on the environment. There's a longer tunnel here in Wendover to make things better there. I think I'm right in saying that there's two miles of track at surface level through areas of outstanding natural beauty. The government has tried uh, on a, a, an environmental level. It, it certainly tried. It would be churlish to pretend it wasn't a, a slight improvement. Uh, but it hasn't changed anything. This is a nationally protected landscape and they're still going to quarry their way through it. We're talking about millions of tonnes of spoil, years and years of disruption whilst heavy lorries use our quiet country lanes. Thousands of metres of ancient hedgerows and ancient woodlands are going to be dug up. It hasn't changed the overall picture. There's still an environmental disaster. And it's, it's worth saying, isn't it, that when this began, it was supposed to be an environmental project. We, it was supposed to prevent flying. It was all about the third runway at Heathrow. The, the environmental credentials are nil. The whole environmental well, case is unravelled. Well, they still reckon the government today is saying four and a half million air, air journeys a year that won't happen if this goes ahead. Nine million journeys will come off the road. I mean, it is a low-carbon alternative, isn't it? No, the, the, these are small numbers. These are small numbers. When you think how many people use the motorways, only 1% of motorway traffic is going to switch. Those short-haul flight slots that will be freed up will become long-haul slots. That, that's 10 times the amount of carbon emitted. Let's not forget, the Transport Select Committee, which looked in this in depth only last autumn, said this must not be called a carbon-reducing scheme. It's not. It will increase carbon emissions. Martin Tett, this is a very conservative area. What's going to be the impact on the party here? Well, it's clearly, obviously, a disappointing thing as far as the party's concerned. We seem to have inherited Labour's old big prestige the project. The Tories backed it, though. Well, the, Tor the, the coalition government has done that. Absolutely right. I can't deny that. It's obviously disappointing. It's a classic Labour scheme. The business case is appalling. It relies on the fact that every minute spent on a train is completely wasted. That's the only way the business case stacks up. And we know in an era of mobile phones and iPods that just isn't true. So UKIP's going to enjoy a resurgence here? Well, we're going to argue the Conservative Party, the Liberal Party, and even parts the Labour Party, right the way along, are united in opposition to this. We think there's a really good economic argument against this in times of austerity. When we're seeing cutbacks in hospitals and schools, quite rightly, to beat the sort of deficit we've got, to be spending this amount of money is just the wrong priority. Martin Tett, Steve Roderick, thank you very much for joining us. The question is, do the numbers really add up? We've been fact-checking claims that HS2 will generate billions of pounds for the UK economy. You can see what we found out on our website.
go to channel4.com forward slash news. We'll have more from here later, but now back to John in London. Well, Cathy, we're joined uh, from Westminster here by the Transport Minister, Norman Baker. Norman Baker, just quickly the politics, because there you had that uh, Conservative uh, leader, um, Mr. Tett, uh, saying, you know, um, Tories and Lib Dems are united against this line. Are you surprised that you've managed to get the Tories to go along with this, given that it's such a predominantly Tory area it's going through? Well, we had three parties before the last election who were in favour of High Speed 2. Uh, Lib Dems were the first party to advocate it. Theresa Villiers, on behalf of the Conservatives, then supported it. And Lord Adonis, Andrew Adonis, took, put down the, the ground rules which have led to today's announcement. So all three parties have uh, recognised the importance of the economy uh, of this particular project. Right now, if you'd said, we're going to throw £32 billion pounds at the entire British rail and road system, you might be winning a lot of votes tonight. I mean, th there are people telling me that, for example, the East Coast Line was built for 12 carriages per train in the 1950s, and they ran them. The platforms were all built for them, but yet today they run eight or nine carriages. <laughs> there the money could have been spent. There are endless examples of ways in which you could have been spending money across the country to much greater effect. Well, John, your argument would make sense if we weren't spending money on rail, but we're actually, never mind HS2, we're embarked on the biggest rail investment programme since Victorian times with Thameslink, Crossrail in its entirety, a big electrification programme, 2,800 new carriages, the reopening of a line between Oxford and Bedford. I could go on. So money is being spent like like never before on railways and roads because you recognise that investment in transport is good for the economy. And in terms of the money being spent this Parliament, which is obviously a difficult economic situation, the preparation costs are probably £750 million this Parliament. And the big costs for HS2 start just as Crossrail finishes. So the, the budget line for Crossrail transfers to HS2. Now, as a backbencher, you've been the scourge of governments passed over spending miscalculations. Uh, and you know better than anybody, if somebody says to you, it's going to be £32 billion, you can be assured it'll be 41, 45, 47, 53. I don't think that's true. And in fact, if you look at the 32 billion, there's, some, there's a huge amount called an, an optimism bias, which is actually an assumption that uh, costs may go up, which is, I think is high as 60%. So we're actually looking at potentially, we will try and bring the figure in under 32 billion. And we're doing great work now with Network Rail to make sure that rail costs come down to get better value for the taxpayer and better value for the fare payer. I'm going to have you on again in 2026, Norman Baker, and put it out to you and see if it's true. Please Thanks do. very much for joining us. Well, welcome back to Wendover. I'm in the Shoulder of Mutton pub, which is absolutely packed with residents who are furious about today's announcement. So I've come to talk to some of them. Tell me, tell me what your reaction is. I think you're, you're trying to sell your house at the moment. Is that right? Uh, yes, I, I work in uh, education. I work for a local university and my job is very uncertain at the moment because of the cuts. Um, and so for financial and personal reasons, um, we put the house on the market 18 months ago. Um, there's been a cloud over the whole area for the last 18 months and it's not just me who's unable to sell there's there's five just five houses in my hamlet alone who who haven't been able to sell their house so your life's on hold really it's it's quite tough very difficult to make decisions about the future at the moment and jim what about you you've you've grown up here i mean how have you seen the 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 countryside change here well to be honest up until now the countryside hasn't really changed and now obviously with everything going on today um, what we're finding is that uh, it's going to be well, devastation in the area, um, and I find that um, I believe that eventually we're going to uh, we're going to have a lot of congestion and everything else around the area, uh, and I think it's going to be uh, well, it's just going to make the whole area into a probably a shambles really, and uh, actually we're very very upset about it really. So. Uh, so it's a sad day for you. It's very a sad emotional. day because I have been I've been living this area all my life, and the Chiltern Hills is uh, a beautiful area. And as far as I'm concerned, this is going to uh, actually ruin the Children's Hills as a general going concern, really. Well, let's move on to the next table now. And Alistair, you're a local businessman here. Um, tell me how it's going to impact your business and others in the area. Well, I, th I think the impact's going to be on Wendover becoming a no-go zone for the period of construction, especially and probably thereafter. Uh, I also think that there's uh, a, 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 every chance that people will stop doing business with local shopkeepers uh, and it will impact on the tourist industry and there is a significant tourist industry here uh, and all in all the long lasting impact is going to be very significant and for someone who's lived and worked in the village for 40 plus years I'm very cross about what's happening. 
Jessica, you are also a, a local businesswoman, um, but coming at it from a slightly different perspective. Yes, that's right. We run a business um, with clients across the UK, and uh, I'm, I'm just disgusted with the business proposal that's been put forward by HS2. Um, as the director of a small to medium-sized business, um, I would be embarrassed, frankly, to be putting my name to something that's so flimsy. Um, all of our, you know, businesses at the moment are, are dealing with recession, having to go to the bank, having to put together business proposals, and uh, it just seems to me that um, the HS2 have failed entirely to put the business case properly but, for this. But business leaders, economists, union leaders, a lot of MPs are all behind it. Not completely. The director of institutes today um, actually said that they were unconvinced and. Well, I think the lever's been pulled on that particular pint. We hope to be back in touch with Cathy a little later in the programme. Now, much has been made of the environmental damage caused by the new high-speed rail line, but the focus has been on physical damage to the countryside. As our science editor, Tom Clark, now reports the arguments over its impact on carbon emissions are more complex. High-speed one is our only existing high-speed rail link. It's the route from London to Ashford, used by Southeastern trains and Eurostar to the continent. It's the first new line bringing state-of-the-art rail travel to Britain since Victorian times. This train is whisking me along at 140 miles an hour, slashing journey times from London to the Kent coast, surely getting people out of dirty cars and planes onto ultra-fast, ultra-modern trains like this must be good for the environment. Well, not necessarily. Consider the average emissions of planet-warming carbon dioxide from different modes of transport averaged across Europe. A short-haul plane journey produces more than 400 grams of carbon dioxide for each kilometre a passenger travels. Replacing a plane with a high-speed train is good. They produce much less CO2 on average, 65 grams per passenger kilometre. But high-speed trains go so fast, they're currently not much greener than the average long-distance car journey, which produces about the same amount of CO2 per passenger. In fact, it's only trains travelling at conventional speeds that get CO2 emissions much lower than cars. But backers of HS2 say it is environmentally justified. Loading more passengers on trains spreads the burden. High-speed rail is much better environmentally than the alternatives, which is travelling by car or travelling by air. And that's because high-speed rail is very efficient at carrying large numbers of people in, in long trains and they're aerodynamically designed. So a high-speed train would have, per passenger, about a third of the emissions of a comparable car journey and a quarter of the emissions of an air journey, the same distance. Streaking through the Chilterns, HS2 could be properly green if it took passengers out of planes by linking to other high-speed networks like HS1. More so if it runs on renewable electricity. But currently HS2 does neither, leaving typically rail-mad environmentalists rather cool. Right now, the best thing to do with 32 billion is invest it in the kinds of transport that people use mostly, buses, local rail services and so forth, and then have a national transport strategy going forward which would tell us where we need to make the really big investments. The environmental battle to build HS2 will be fought over ancient woods and meadows dotting its route. And based on current numbers, the project's backers will be hard pushed to argue ploughing them up is justified by a greater environmental benefit. Well, back again at the shoulder of Mutton Pub. I'm sorry we had some sound problems earlier. I think we can pick up now with Sue. Just tell me what your concerns are about the democratic deficit. Yes, all the government needs to do now is just nod it through with a hybrid bill in Parliament. There they did a full consultation. There will be no planning process. The consultation was, in fact, the only thing we had. We had very little faith in the outcome of it. And we don't actually know what the outcome was, but we do understand that there were significant people who voted against it um, and we see that was the only thing we had it will just now go through and I don't call that democracy. Marion there's already a railway line here oh, a railway line a new railway line in a way you could say well what difference is that going to make if there's already an existing railway line here there's a bypass you know it's a busy busy country. 
It's not that busy, I can assure you. We have uh, a fairly good train service here, but it's a local service. It serves a number of communities along the line. HS2 will go straight from London to Birmingham. It will bring absolutely no benefits to this part of the country or to anywhere else between those two major cities. And I have to say that the government's arguments uh, for the benefits that it's proposed that uh, this line will bring to Birmingham are really very uh, flimsy. There's no evidence that those benefits will be there at all. It's a huge amount of money to spend on something that will not deliver what the government is saying it will deliver. Well, thank you to everyone here at the Shoulder and Mutton Pub. John, back to you. From Matt with Mitt in Manchester, New Hampshire, to uh, Cathy, uh, who's in uh, uh, Wendover, Old Buckinghamshire. Cathy. Tonight's main news, the government's given the green light to a high-speed rail link from London to the northwest. The first section, to be completed by 2026, will take passengers from London to Birmingham in 49 minutes. But opponents of the scheme are planning a legal challenge. Well, I'm joined now by our science editor, Tom Clark, and our business correspondent, Sarah Smith. Sarah, the government's making a big deal of HS2 being a real money spinner. Are they right? Well, the first thing to say is the figures that they're basing this on are economic projections that go 60 years into the future, and you just cannot predict economics that far ahead. So what we're looking at here is informed guesswork, not predictions, really. Even if you talk to managing directors who are the most enthusiastic business people for this proposal, they admit they'll be long retired before the first passenger ever actually gets onto one of these trains. But that said, the government have given us their figures, and they insist that for every pound of taxpayer money that's spent on this project, it will generate somewhere between £1.80 and £2.50 in in economic growth. Well worth it. They say business organisations say it's probably not the best use of investment in the money. Businesses in the north are very, very enthusiastic about this because they say it will re redistribute economic growth around the country, but whether it's actual value for money, getting back £1.80 for £1 spent, a lot of people would dispute that. So what's better value for money then? Well, you talk to um, many of the business organisations like the Institute of Directors who are not so sure that they're backing this scheme. They say you would get £6 back if you were to build a new motorway. Most businesses say actually it's aviation that they want, whether it's another runway in the southeast. Even more, actually, we would want more aviation capacity outside of London and the southeast. And of course, building another runway at Heathrow, for instance, wouldn't cost the taxpayer anything. That would be done by um, BAA. And Tom, it's not as low carbon as an alternative as, as you might think. Well, I've got to be careful what I say in a room like this about the environmental benefits of high speed rail. But I mean, they are there. About a quarter of the emissions compared to flying on a high-speed train. When it comes to cars, it's kind of marginal. It's about the same as taking a long-distance car journey and going on a high-speed train. So when they want to make an environmental case for it, it's a little bit trickier. And in order to be environmentally positive, the network has to be connected. It has to take people from somewhere to somewhere they want to go. For example, a high-speed link from Manchester all the way to Paris would get people off planes. It would also get people off trains elsewhere on the network, freeing up more seats getting more people out of cars onto those train services which are currently overcrowded. Until HS2 can prove that it's going to do that, its sort of broader environmental benefits will be quite hard for its backers to argue. And just quickly, environmentally, all this tunnelling the government's trumpeting about, will that help? Well, it'll certainly save the worst of the environmental disruption that it's going to cause in this area when the, 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 the digging goes ahead, if it happens. <laughs> All right, a yeah. point to, to be lynched. further debated, yeah. but it will certainly... They're spending a lot of money to try and mitigate that, you know, a huge amount of money to build a tunnel that long. But what environmental campaigners argue, if you spent that money on small improvements like rural bus services or better local rail services, where the majority of our emissions come from, you could do a, your environmental benefits would be a lot harder, a lot greater, but a lot less spend. Tom Clark, Sarah Smith, thank you very much. That's all from the Shoulder of Mutton pub where residents are now going on to meet to decide what to do about today's announcement. <laughs>